learning to write a scientific pitch. Some of the workshops were about learning different careers in the science communication field. And this was an extremely important initiative because as we know, there's a ton of false information floating around online. And so now more than ever, it's really important that scientists can communicate the findings of their research, not just to each other, but also to the general public. And because even if someone doesn't have a science background, it's important for them to understand scientific issues and scientific research, which can help them make informed decisions. And so the three minute thesis is the final event in this series. And it's a great opportunity for students to develop both their communication and presentation skills, which will ultimately help them with their goals of entering a job in the academic or professional job market. And so with this goal in mind, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, the judges will be taking notes about the student presentations to highlight what was done well and any areas for improvement. Okay, so just to give you guys a little bit of uh, overview of what this competition is all about, the 3MT or three minute thesis is a research communication competition, like Allison just mentioned, during which PhD students have just three minutes to present a compelling oration on their thesis as well as its significance. So to put things into perspective, an 80,000 word PhD thesis would take about nine hours to present. And our competitors today just have one 180th of that time to cover their dissertation work in a manner that makes sense to a non-specialist audience. So the 3MT was developed by the University of Queensland or UQ in 2008. Um, and enthusiasm for the 3MT concept has developed rapidly. And now these competitions are held in over 900 universities and institutions across 85 countries worldwide. So the idea for the three minute thesis competition came at a about a time when the state of Queensland was suffering a severe drought. So to conserve water, many residents were encouraged to time their showers, and a lot of people had three minute egg timers fixed to the walls of their bathroom. The then Dean of the UQ Graduate School, Professor Alan Lawson, put two and two together, and the idea for the 3MT competition was born. As enthusiasm grew across universities in Australia and New Zealand, a multinational 3MT event was created, and the inaugural Trans-Tasman 3MT was held at UQ in 2010. Moving forward into 2013, Universitas 21, the leading global network of research-intensive universities, held the first U21 virtual 3MT, in line with their mission of fostering global citizenship and institutional innovation through research-inspired teaching and learning, student mobility, connecting students and staff, and wider advocacy for internationalization. Moving forward to 2016, the 3MT brought about an expansion of the Trans-Tasman 3MT competition that was held in New Zealand and Australia to include universities from Southeast and North Asia, Asia regions. The competition since then has been called the Asia-Pacific 3MT competition, and is hosted annually by the University of Queensland and is sponsored by Springer Nature. Like I said before, the 3MT competitions are now held in over 900 universities across more than 85 countries worldwide, including those in North and South America, Africa, and Europe. And so now I'm going to introduce our judges and I hope that the judges will unmute themselves as we go through um, every person and they can give you a little bit of background about their journey um, with science communication and science advocacy because I think we have a really excellent panel of judges this year and they all have very diverse and interesting backgrounds and so our first judge is Dr. Christy Shuda McGuire, um, who currently works at the Wistar Institute as the Associate Dean of Biomedical Sciences. Hi, everybody. I'm Christy Shuda McGuire. Um, I actually did a master's of uh, science education at Drexel University before coming to Thomas Jefferson University um, to earn my PhD in genetics. Um, I was a faculty member in the biology department at the Community College of Philadelphia for 11 years before taking the leap into higher education administration. Um, 
I was an assistant dean for the College of um, Science and Math and the School of Health Professions at Rowan University. Um, and then uh, was recruited back over the bridge to the Wistar Institute, um, where I'm currently Associate Dean of Biomedical Studies and oversee a pipeline of uh, education programs from high school students to postdoctoral fellows. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at uh, Jefferson, um, where I developed and teach our GC740 Principles of Pedagogy and GC741 Principles of Science Pedagogy uh, courses. So a plug for that, there's still room in <laughs> GC740 for the fall semester. Nice, thank you, Christy. And our next judge is Dr. Kimberly Scotta, who um, is a cancer researcher, STEM advocate, and she is a former president of the Association of Women in Science. Um, are you there, Kim? You may be muted. Is she in the meeting? Okay, we can keep moving. I do not see her in the meeting right now. She was previously. Okay, next we have Luke Brand, who is an associate editor at the American Association for Cancer Research. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Allison said, my name is Luke. I'm currently working as an editor for the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, my training mostly revolved around prostate can cancer in various forms. Um, did my undergrad or my graduate work at University of Minnesota uh, before coming out to Thomas Jefferson for my postdoc. Um, and I basically studied a lot about androgen receptor biology, drug resistance, and some immunotherapy projects in, uh, in the context of prostate cancer. Um, after about uh, three and a half years of postdocing, I decided that the academic route wasn't really looking like it was where I wanted to be putting uh, my career efforts. And so I started looking around and it just so happened that AACR had this opening for an associate editor position. So um, given my interest in, uh, in the scientific literature and science writing and communication, I decided that was a really good place for me to uh, try and get a foot in the door and it turned out that, that worked out pretty well. I've been here for a couple of years now and it's going really, really well. Um, if you have any questions about the editing uh, life or what, what goes on behind the editor's desk, I'd be happy to engage with anybody uh, via email after this is over. I know people have a lot of questions about that. It's a side of academics and publishing that uh, a lot of people don't really get an insight into. So I'm here to be a communicator both for the publishing uh, side of things as well as just science in general. So looking forward to seeing some awesome talks today. Thank you, Luke. Um, and then we have another judge, uh, Dr. Robert Ring, who is the CEO of KRIS Bioscience. And I know he has a very unique background as an artist as well. So I'm excited for him to <laughs> talk a little bit about that. Uh, yep. Uh, nice to see everyone. My name is Rob Bring. Um, hey, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist by training. Uh, so I'm going to argue having double majored in fine art and biochemistry in my undergrad years out in California where I'm from. I spent maybe six years after college trying to make it as an artist. And you can go to robbringart.com and get a laugh and see, uh, see that part of my journey. But, uh, I've spent the better part of my, my career as a, as a scientist um, in the world of treatment development. Um, spent a lot of that time in industry, uh, worked for Wyeth and Pfizer. I, I headed um, all of that in psychiatric and neurological medicines development. The company that I head right now develops um, uh, medicines for rare uh, genetic syndromes that cause neurodevelopmental disorders, autism um, being one of the primary ones. I haven't always worked in industry. I, I spent five years as the chief science officer of Autism Speaks, which is one of the largest global patient advocacy and research or, uh, foundations in the world. Um, I hold uh, adjunct positions in psychiatry at Mount Sinai and across the, uh, the city at Drexel in pharmacology and, and um, 
and physiology. So I, you know, I've worn a lot of hats in my career, uh, the patient space industry, academia, and uh, one might argue I'm multilingual in the, the various vernaculars that define this larger ecosystem that we're all involved in. But at the end of the day, it's the same value chain of trying to turn science into things that matter for, for families and patients out there. We all play different roles. And communication is such a, a central part of, 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 uh, of that journey, not as just as individuals, but as we shepherd that science towards patients. And, um, you know, you always hear about the elevator pitch, uh, whatever you do, this is so, so, like, so similar to that. I can't wait to hear uh, these students uh, give, give these talks and looking forward to the discussions afterwards. Thank you, Rob. We're excited to have you here with us today. And then our last judge is Dr. Neil Bardhan, who is a science communication consultant. Hi there, uh, pleasure to be here today, uh, particularly because today is arguably the seventh anniversary of when I left academic science. Uh, so kind of an auspicious date for all of this. Um, prior to that, uh, I did a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester. Uh, and then I did a, a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, uh, where I studied how people learn to understand different foreign accents uh, and ran experiments on that. Uh, but over the course of, of that, I realized I probably wasn't going to be in academia uh, at, at the bench for the rest of my life because I was so interested in how my colleagues were, were talking to each other uh, or not talking to each other <laughs> more often uh, than not. Um, I, I was fascinated by how whether it was a job talk, a seminar from an established researcher, or casual conversation over coffee, um, people had all these challenges about talking about their work. And so I started to cultivate a bit of an interest in that uh, and some, some toolkits around that, um, specifically within slide presentations. Uh, and that helped me launch my consulting firm um, when I moved to Philadelphia, uh, August 2013. Um, but along the way, I realized that there were, there were a lot of other toolkits that I wanted to pick up, including storytelling, comedy, uh, using this background in, in theater um, that I'd leaned on a bit in, in undergrad but hadn't picked up in a while. Uh, and so that has led me to a, a number of different projects. Um, I've taught improv to scientists at molecular biology conferences and uh, biotech firms. Um, I've taught storytelling at uh, Penn Nursing uh, and the ComSciCon conference uh, set. Um, so these days, I run some things through uh, my consulting business that you see, but I also am the director of applied storytelling at First Person Arts, which is a Philly-based nonprofit, uh, and we bring the, the power of true storytelling to um, the important issues of our time. And uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, year and set of years to be helping people engage around the experiences that they've had and how those speak to larger issues in society. Um, but the, the core of my work is helping understand why does everybody get out of bed every morning and do the work that they do? Uh, and we're going to hear a bit more of that today. So super excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to all of our judges for taking time out of their day to help us with this competition. We really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to discuss the rules very quick of the competition. So some of the rules that are set by the 3MT committee. Obviously, it has to be three minutes, uh, no longer than three minutes. If it is longer than three minutes, the contestants are automatically disqualified. Um, it has to be spoken word, so that means no poems or songs. The presentation begins when the speaker starts speaking or moving. There's one slide, so that means one static slide, no animations, no props, no like lab equipment, nothing. You can use your hands, that's it. And then this is a talk gauge for a non-specialist audience and the judge's decisions are final. And so the judges will be using a specific set of criteria to uh, judge these competition, this competition, and it will be based on two main categories, um, comprehension and content and engagement and communication. So for comprehension and content, the judges will be assessing whether the speaker has accurately described the background and purpose of their research while avoiding jargon or overly technical scientific terms. 
the judges will also be looking for the speaker to describe their impact of their research um, in a way appropriate for a non-specialist audience. So this should be a talk that anyone from an expert scientist in cancer biology to your grandmother should be able to understand these talks. And so based on that, this is not a science talk. This is not a poster presentation. There should be no data, no statistics. Um, and the judges will not be judging the science. They're going to really judge the ability of the individual to effectively communicate the importance of their work. And then for engagement and communication, the judges will be looking at how, how well the speaker engaged the audience and made them want to learn more about that area of research. And so this includes enthusiasm, stage presence, as well as the slide that all of the speakers have made to complement their talk. The judges will not be critiquing the speaker's choice of metaphor or the area of the research that the speaker works in. And based on the judges scoring, there will be prizes. So there will be first, second, and third place prizes. The first place winner will be going to the regional competition if they choose. Um, and then there will also be a fun option for a people's choice. So at the end of the competition, stick around to the end because all of the participants will be able to vote on their personal favorite and that um, individual win the People's Choice Award. Okay, so with that, we're gonna start the competition. So I'd first like to introduce Alana Molotsky. She's in the Neuroscience PhD program. She's in Dr. Diane Mary's lab and the title of her talk is Neuronal Legos. So just give me one second to get my timer ready. And then Ilana, whenever you wanna start, go for it. Okay, I'm ready. Remember when you were a kid, and you'd get that new Lego set. To begin building your masterpiece, you would take individual Lego bricks and snap them together to create small parts. Those small parts would come together to make a super cool spaceship. But what if you went back and tried to rebuild the spaceship and some of the pieces were missing? It would come out unsturdy and misshapen. Our brain cells, called neurons, use similar building blocks to maintain their structure and shape. These neuronal Legos are called neurofilament subunits, and they come in many sizes. Just like Lego bricks, neurofilament subunits come in small, medium, and large, and they come together to create the structural protein neurofilament. Neurofilaments give neurons the structure and shape that allows them to send signals all over our bodies. The neurons that send signals from our brain and spinal cord to the muscles that help us walk, talk, and breathe are called motor neurons. Motor neurons must be extra sturdy because a single motor neuron can be up to a meter long. So what would happen if these Lego bricks went missing from neurons, which are already susceptible to degeneration because of their length? The motor neurons would break down, causing a disease with symptoms such as an inability to walk, talk, or swallow. This is exactly what happens in the disease I study called spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy, or SBMA. My work shows that there's a change in the amount of these Lego bricks. And in mice with SBMA, there's a deficit in the amount of large Lego bricks. Without the proper amount of large Lego bricks, this alters the structure and functionality of neurofilaments. And without functional neurofilaments, the neurons become unsturdy and misshapen just like the spaceship we tried to rebuild when we didn't have all of the pieces. Without the proper amount of Lego bricks, patients with SBMA have motor neurons that are more susceptible to breakage or injury, and this eventually leads to motor neuron death. But if we could restore the amount of Lego bricks, we may be able to increase the quality of life for patients with this disease and possibly those with other neurodegenerative diseases as well. Thank you. Great job, Alana. 
So I will give the judges a minute to write down any feedback or talk um, in any interest that they have in this talk, and then we can move on to the next talk. So next I'd like to introduce Allison Depew. She's also in the neuroscience PhD program. She's in Dr. Tim Mosca's lab. And the title of her talk is Together Forever, How Connections Form in the Brain. So Allison, whenever you start talking is when I'll start the timer. Sometimes I wonder, how does dating work? Here's what I found on Google and it's only four steps. Step one is finding the right partner. Nowadays, that means downloading a dating app and swiping through hundreds of profiles to find your soulmate. Then, in step two, you exchange messages and make plans to meet up in person. Next, you go on a date, and it's love at first sight. So you build a strong relationship, and finally, get married and spend the rest of your lives together. Now, I don't know if this is always how people form meaningful connections in real life, but it is how connections form in your brain. Let me explain. Your brain is made up of cells called neurons. These neurons form connections with each other, where they send and receive chemical signals to communicate. These connections are called synapses, and they allow us to learn new things, move our muscles, and experience the world around us. Synapses are really important, and because of that, the way that they form during development is also really important. And it's a lot like dating. We know that our neurons use these same four steps when they're forming a connection during development. First, a neuron must find the correct partner cell. Then, they exchange messages. These messages coordinate the cells to build a strong structure. And finally, like a marriage, some synapses last for an entire lifetime. But if something goes wrong at any of these early stages of the budding relationship, like a bad date or poor communication, the connection might not form properly. When this happens, it can result in neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and epilepsy. Despite how important synaptic development is, we still don't fully understand it. But like any relationship, we know that communication is key. For my thesis, I'm studying communication between neurons at stage two of their relationship when they're exchanging messages during development. I study a receptor a tool that the cell uses to receive messages from other cells. So far, I found that this receptor is present in neurons, and when we get rid of it, the connection doesn't form properly. It might be structurally weak or not even form at all. When the receptor is not there, the messages don't get delivered, and the neurons don't end up happily married. But how does it ensure that this connection forms? This is the question that my thesis seeks to answer. I'm working on figuring out what chemical message the receptor receives and what it does in the cell once it receives that message. By figuring out answers to these questions and the role of this receptor during development, we'll better understand how our neurons go from swiping right to tying the knot. Thank you. Great job, Allison. So I'll give another minute to the judges to their scores. Okay, so the next person that is going to be speaking is Gabby Schur. She's in the Immunology and Microbiopathogenesis PhD program. 
She is in Dr. Matthias Schnell's lab, and the title of her talk is Two in One, a Single Vaccine for Two Viruses. Whenever you're ready, Gabby. Hey, let me take a bath. How many of you have heard those words? It just takes too long for kids. Solution, two in one, shampoo and body wash. Shorter showers and parents are happy because kids still clean their hair and bodies properly. What if I told you that the two in one principle could be applied to protecting people against infectious diseases? That we could use an already well-established vaccine to fight off two viruses at once. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, CCHFV, is a virus that kills nearly 50% of the people that are infected with it. The virus has a large global distribution spanning across regions of Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. CCHFV is spread through ticks, and although it can infect a wide variety of animals, it only causes disease in humans. Unfortunately, there are no vaccines or treatments against it. The goal of my thesis project is to develop a vaccine against CCHFV using the very well-established rabies vaccine. It's a good match because not only is the rabies vaccine effective, safe, and currently used worldwide, but rabies virus infects people in many of the same regions as CCHFV. The first step in designing a vaccine is picking which part of the virus you want to target. For my vaccine, I decided to use these special molecules called glycoproteins that exist on the surface of viruses and allow them to infect cells. Being on the surface of viruses makes glycoproteins easily accessible to the immune cells that fight off the virus. Plus, previous research has shown that the body's responses to these molecules can protect against the virus. Much like body wash is added to shampoo for the two-in-one shampoo and body wash, I added the CCHFV glycoproteins into the rabies virus to produce this new two-in-one vaccine. The resulting vaccine has both CCHFV and rabies virus glycoproteins present on its surface. During vaccination, the body recognizes both viruses and can mount protective responses uh, against CCHFV and rabies virus at the same time. Just like the two-in-one shampoo and body wash cleans both the hair and the body, this new two-in-one vaccine can prime the body to protect against CCHFV and rabies virus simultaneously. It's clear that we need a way to prevent CCHFV given the nearly 50% fatality rate and our lack of ways to treat it. My hope is that similar to the two-in-one shampoo and body wash, Combining these two viruses into one vaccine will effectively protect people against CCHFV and rabies virus. Great job, Gabby. Thank you. So we'll give the judges a minute to take their scores. So our next contestant is Daniel Wang. He's also in the Immunology and Microbial Pathogenesis PhD program. He's in Dr. Abdul Mohammed Rotizmi's lab. 
And his, the title of his talk is Targeting Myeloid Cells in an Animal Model of Multiple Sclerosis, Filling a Gap in Treatment Options. Okay, Daniel, whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Um, in my lab, we study the disease multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease of the brain that affects approximately 4 million people worldwide and actually whose incidence has nearly doubled in the last decade or so. Um, MS is not a disease that kills you, but it can significantly affect your quality of life. It can affect your ability to walk, to talk, to see. It can heighten your sensitivity to pain. It can cause depression and uh, many other things. And with a average onset of 30 years of age, it's also a disease you might have to live with for a very long time. The symptoms of MS are caused by immune cells, which enter the brain and attack it, forming lesions that are full of these immune cells. Here on the left, you can see an example of one of these lesions. And you might notice that it's actually full of these purple or magenta cells. And these cells are called myeloid cells. And in fact, myeloid cells are up to 80% of the harmful cells in the brain. And given these statistics, you would imagine that most MS drugs should target myeloid cells, right? But that's actually not the case. In fact, no single drug on the market for treating MS directly and specifically targets myeloid cells. And that's despite their large numbers in these lesions. And that's despite overwhelming evidence of their direct involvement in causing the symptoms of MS. My project aims to address that gap. So you can imagine that maybe one way we can do this is by targeting something that myeloid cells need to survive. But that's actually not as easy as it sounds. Uh, and this is primarily owed to the fact that in addition to those cells that um, cause disease, there are also beneficial cells, beneficial myeloid cells uh, in the brain. And so in theory, an ideal therapy would target only the harmful cells while preserving the beneficial or health promoting ones. To see if that were possible, I tested a number of different candidates in an animal model of MS. And what I found was that if you target a molecule called CSF1, which is a growth factor for myeloid cells, you can then, in fact, specifically destroy only the harmful myeloid cells while preserving those myeloid cells that are beneficial to health. Moreover, because we've actually removed the bulk of cells which are harmful to the, to the MS patient, uh, this actually also suppressed the disease profoundly and, and could do so for as long as we tested these treatments. Ultimately, my hope is that therapies that target uh, CSF1 will offer a safe and effective means of targeting myeloid cells in the autoimmune disease multiple sclerosis. That's my three-minute thesis. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Great job. So we'll give the judges a minute to deliberate. Okay, our next contestant is Shannon McGettigan. She's in the Immunology Microbial Pathogenesis Program. She's in Dr. Gudron Dubois' lab. And the title of her talk is B-Rive Lesson Plans, How Do You Teach a B-Cell to Stop Misbehaving Immune Cells? Okay, so Shannon, whenever you're ready. Do you remember back in school, there was that one kid who was always getting into trouble? They would get overly excited and cause lots of havoc. 
they may have had friends who were able to calm them down. Maybe you were the troublemaker, or maybe you were the calming friend. You know, this really cool teacher who would teach you ways to relax and stay calm whenever trouble would come up. I'd like you to imagine with me that the immune system is like a school. So every day, students encounter new material and they review old lessons. This is similar to what the cells in your immune system have to do. When your body is infected by a virus or a bacteria, your immune system gears up, fights it off, and then it settles back down without attacking or hurting you in the process. But sometimes, like the school troublemakers, some immune cells will get overly excited and they will fight things that they're not supposed to be fighting and that can damage your body. Sometimes this can even lead to a variety of diseases like psoriasis and lupus. I am interested in studying one cell, one of the immune cells that acts like the calming friend, and that is called a Bregs. So Bregs produce a small molecule that says to overactive immune cells, hey, you need to calm down before you hurt the rest of the body. So in my thesis, I am interested in studying what are the signals or the lessons that teach a B, reg, a B cell to be like a B reg and calm other overactive immune cells down. And through my research, I've made some interesting findings. So mice that are completely lacking a particular protein in their blood, this is called IgM, they actually have up to 10 times as many B regs as compared to normal healthy mice. So I am interested in, to understand how IgM is actually teaching B cells to develop into a B reg. And by understanding these particular signals, we can then manipulate them and generate fewer or more B regs depending on the disease a patient might have. So just like in school where we can teach students they need to settle down after an exciting day, I hope that my research will teach us the appropriate lesson plans so that we can teach Bregs to calm down the immune system appropriately when an infection is over so that your body is not hurt and you don't develop diseases like lupus or psoriasis. Thank you. Great, thank you Shannon. Give the judges a minute to deliberate, and then we'll be on to our last contestant. Okay, our final 3MT contestant for 2020 is Tess Cherlin. She's in the Genetics, Genomics, and Cancer Biology PhD program. She's in Dr. Isidore Raguzzo's lab. And the title of her talk is, Who Will Get Cancer? Developing a Personalized Cancer Prediction Tool. So Tess, whenever you are ready. We all know someone who's been affected by cancer. That's because 40% of people will get cancer in their lifetime. That's two in every five people. Two of these kids will get cancer someday. Which two will they be? While well, great strides have been made in cancer detection, diagnosis, and treatment, cancer prediction is still lagging. That's because cancer does not have a single cause. Your biology, environment, occupation, and lifestyle all contribute to cancer risk. Cancer is personal and capitalizes on the unique features that make you, 
you. You can think of these features like a character profile in a video game, telling us the background of a character, physical traits, skill level, etc. Based on these features, we can predict how a character will behave in the game. Similarly, based on your profile, we, can we should be able to predict if you will get cancer. The reality is not so clear. While some predictors of cancer are genes, like the BRCA gene in breast cancer, it's not one size fits all. Our cells are filled with material in addition to genes that also have the potential to predict cancer. That's where I come in. My thesis research focuses on the small molecules in our cells called RNAs. I take data from patient samples from hundreds of people, both cancerous and uncancerous, and look at these small molecules in those RNAs and compare them. For example, I look at the RNAs that are different in the cells between women versus men, or that are different between people from Finland versus people from Italy. More specifically, what I'm working on right now is analyzing the RNAs in the cells of women with triple negative breast cancer and comparing them to the RNAs in healthy women. While I've found significant differences, work is still underway to determine if these RNAs could be a predictive tool for this cancer. In a video game, when a character faces a challenge, we know that its size, strength, agility all contribute to its success if it's going to help or hinder that character. Likewise, the RNAs that I found during my PhD, we hope that they can help predict if a person is at risk for or protected from certain cancers. RNAs are just one piece of the cancer prediction puzzle, but the goal is to bring them all together to design a cancer prediction tool that is individualized for each person. Only then can we predict which of these kids will get cancer and make interventions to help them live happy, healthy lives. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tess. Awesome job. So that concludes all of our contestants for 2020. Um, we'll let the judges deliberate for about 15 minutes, but first, before everyone turns their video off, we want to talk about the people's choice. Hello, everyone. So I do not envy the judges their decision. The six contestants were amazing. You guys, you did amazing. So right now it's everyone in the audience and I see we have 143 people, which is amazing. So all of you who just watched these six contestants will be voting for your favorite, for people's choice. And here are some of the judging criteria that we went over earlier. And try to use them, but honestly, if you are a grandparent on this call, obviously vote for your grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> so the judging criteria, like we talked about before, comprehension and content. Did the presentation help the audience understand the research? Was the thesis topic and its significance communicated in language appropriate to an intelligent but non-specialist audience? And secondly, engagement and communication. Did the oration make the audience want to know more? Did the speaker have sufficient stage presence, eye contact, and vocal range? maintain a steady pace and have a confident stance. So I hope I don't envy any of anyone the, 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 their choice for favorite, but right now a poll will pop up. So give it some time, think about it and vote for who you think should be our choice. And the judges will go into their breakout room and make the ultimate specialist decision. So I'm gonna launch the poll in a second. Um, Zoom is giving me some technical difficulties right now, so just bear with me while I try and launch the poll. And then like we said earlier, the judges are deliberating, so we'll probably give them about 15 minutes, so at 2.05, we'll try to announce the winners.
So Tess, can you show us your dogs? Tess, did you hear me? Oh, wait, hold on. No, I didn't. What are you saying? Can you show us your dogs? John, there's 136 people here. I'm not showing my dog. <laughs> Although she is very cute. Hi everyone, so we were having some technical difficulties with the poll, um, and if you look at your chat, I will send you a, everyone, a Google poll that you can go in and vote for your, your choice, and it also has this flyer with the images at the bottom of the poll. So please click on the link and vote for your favorite. Unfortunately, I don't think they're in the order they presented. I apologize. Great job troubleshooting that cat. That's awesome. Woo! Made the poll in under two minutes. Go yes. Me. Thanks, cat. It's telling me that I'm logged in from multiple devices and it won't let me launch the poll. So I don't know what that even means, but thank you, Zoom. <laughs> I know. Um, I love that we like troubleshooted this all last night too. So guys, we did we did practice. It's just you never know. Yes, we tested this out and um, for some reason it wants to not work on the day that we need it to work. So <laughs> thanks, Kat.
I resent the poll again, but I put good poll instead of Google poll. It's a good day and it's a good poll. Okay, Kat, and then once you have everyone's recorded answers, just announce who the people's choice is. Will do. Also, don't, don't vote multiple times, guys. There's 134 people on the Zoom call, and I already have 140 submissions. I think it's going to be fantastic to see the people's choice and how this lines up. Who said vote early, vote often? Yeah, it's Dr. Raj. Hey, everyone, results are in. Are you ready? Drum roll, please. And the winner of People's Choice is Tess. Congratulations, Tess. Thank you. What an honor. Great job, Tess. Great job, Tess. Excellent earrings, I might add. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. This has been great. And it was really fun and very stressful, but very fun. Okay, I am going to be announcing the first, second, and third place winners as well. And I am pleased to announce that third place was also won by Tess. So yay, congratulations, Tess. Well Thank done. You. You're a rich woman. Don't spend it all in one place. Okay, second place winner is Allison Depew. Yay! Well done. Excellent talk, Allison. Thank you. Okay. And finally, our first place winner of the Three Minute Thesis 2020 Zoom version GSA competition is Shannon McGettigan. Yay! Woohoo! Thank Woo! you. <laughs> Amazing. Well Great done job. to everyone. This has been uh, really interesting and really fun for me. This is the first time I've actually ever watched the three minute thesis competition because I, um, you know, I wasn't even at school last year when we had it. So this has been really cool for me. And um, I just wanted to give a, a final shout out to our sponsor, JCLS and Dr. Granwald, um, all of our supporters, judges, and the participants, and especially the audience, it was so great to see such a, a huge crowd come onto Zoom for this. I really um, think a lot of it 
can be attributed to all of the work that like Daniel Park did, that Kat did, everyone who was in charge of advertising the flyers. And it was just really uh, spectacular to see this all come together so wonderfully. So thanks again, everyone for watching and we hope to see you next year. And welcome to all the new students. If you're on this call, welcome to Jefferson. Yes, welcome. welcome It'll be great. Hope to see you guys whenever you pass your comprehensives for this. If the contestants would like to stay on the Zoom for a little bit longer, the judges said that they would stay here and give you some feedback um, to use for future three-minute theses or just um, areas of improvement and things they liked. So if you would like that feedback, just stay on the call.